But good morning. good morning. You gotta have some energy. It's a rain. How many of you would be honest and say it was a little hard to get out of bed today? Unless you have kids, because they get you out of bed, right? But like rainy days like this are, are no fun. It feels like it always rains after Easter. But man, I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm not gonna make any old jokes or anything like that, right? We're just gonna go and we're gonna have a good time together. But before we get into uh, to God's word today, uh, and if you weren't here, that's because I, I said that this was the old church, but I meant the original. That's, I didn't mean you were old, just, to, just so you know. I, I, wasn't, I was not saying that. I'm just gonna clarify the original. We're gonna go with the original. Just wanted to celebrate with you a little. How many of you were here last week for Easter? Easter Sunday, such an awesome time at both of our campuses, man. And um, I wanted to celebrate with you as you, if you, if you haven't been here, you don't know this, uh, every year we take our offering on Easter and we give it away. Uh, it, it's usually our biggest offering of the year and it's an offering that we give completely away uh, to different churches, organizations, things like that. This year we were partnering with uh, Convoy of Hope, who we partner with a lot here. Uh, they're an organization that feeds people who are hungry, disaster relief, all kinds of things all over the world. A great organization. And, um, and last week between the two campuses, uh, you guys gave close to $60,000. And um, so yeah, we, we want to celebrate that. Um, one of our core values, right, is that we want to be a church that's sacrificially generous, and we love when we get to actually put that into practice in a very practical way. So thank you guys for your generosity. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up our series today called Jesus Is. Uh, if you're new, join us next week again. We'll be kicking off a brand new series going through the book of Ephesians. So that's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to take us probably about 12 weeks or so as we kind of go through the book of Ephesians verse by verse and, and chapter by chapter. But today we're going to be wrapping up our series Jesus Is. And if you weren't here during this series, we've been looking at some of the events leading up to and through Easter and, and talking about who Jesus revealed himself to be, who he showed himself to be, who he said he was, and who he wants to be in our, our lives. And so as we wrap up this series today, I want to talk about this idea of, of failure. Who is Jesus in our lives when we've failed? Who does Jesus want to be in our lives when we've, when we've dropped the ball, when we've made a mistake, when we've messed up? Come on, how many of you would agree that failure is not something we really like talking about that much? Unless it's somebody else's failure. Like, we, we don't mind talking about other people's failures, right? We don't like talking about our own. Let's just be real honest. We need to make sure we're on the same. How many of you would be honest enough to say there's times when you go through the grocery store, and when you're about to check out, you look at those magazines with all the Hollywood, you know, rumors and gossip? Maybe you don't pick it up, but you read, the, you read the titles. Oh, man, I can't believe they're getting divorced. I called it, right? Like, and you just look at their failures, and we judge other people's failures. We're really good at, at, at being okay with other people's failures. We don't really like, like, if that was our failures on the front of a magazine, we wouldn't be too, too happy with that. But the reality is failure is a part of every single one of our stories. Every single person in this room has experienced some failures. Come on, how many of you would say that there's been some times in your life where you experienced failures and you wanted to quit? Like you wanted to give up, you, were, you just wanted to throw in the towel. And it could be little things, right? It doesn't always have to be big things. It could be little things like failing a test or a class in school, not making a sports team or getting cut, failing your driver's test, some of us multiple times. It could be big failures like a failed business, a failed relationship, a failed marriage. The reality is failure is just a part of our lives. It's something that every single one of us experience and, and have to deal with. But I want to encourage you today when it comes to failure is that failure does not have to be fatal or final in our lives. It doesn't have to have the last word in our lives. In fact, with Jesus, our setbacks, our failures can be a setup for our greatest comebacks. Like that's just the truth we see in God's word. In fact, one of the things I love about the Bible and reading the Bible is that the Bible is all about Jesus, but it's full of stories of people who are just like you and me. Like if you read the Bible, the only hero in the story, the only person who's, who's never failed was God. The rest of the people in the Bible kind of stink at life. Like, let's just be real. Like there's heroes of our faith, Father Abraham, David, all these people. If you read their stories, you know, like there's some, there's some sketchy stuff. There's some failures in their, in their past. Some adultery, some murder, some telling, you know, some telling somebody that your wife was your sister so to save yourself. Like there's some weird stuff in the, in the Bible about these people. These people were, were normal people, everyday people, average people, people who made mistakes and failed and God still used them. And we're going to look at one of those guys today, a guy who was really, really close with Jesus. In fact, he was handpicked by Jesus 
to be one of his disciples, one of his inner circle disciples, a disciple that he was going to use to change the world, and a disciple that didn't always get it right. We're going to look at Peter's life. I like talking about Peter because I can relate to Peter. Like, I, I just imagine, how many of you will watch the show The Chosen? If you don't watch it, you need to watch it. But the, the way they uh, describe and show Peter, I feel like is very accurate. Like, Peter is just, he is all passion, all heart, and kind of like half a brain sometimes. And I, and I feel it. Like, I, I understand because that's, that's my personality at times. Like, there's many times where we see throughout Scripture that Peter, like, his passion led him to a place where his foot was into his mouth, right? Like, there was times where he would say things. Like, always, you, you see this passion and this energy but also this falling short. Like I was thinking about Peter's life. There was this time in Peter's life where they were in the boat with the other disciples and Jesus decided that he was going to, you know, water ski to them without water skis. And he walks across the water to them. And they look out there and Peter's in the boat and he looks at Jesus and instead of saying, Jesus, get in the boat. He says, Jesus, I'm gonna come out to you. And so he just gets out of the boat and starts walking on water like Jesus. It's going really well for a second, right? That passion led him to just experience a miracle in that moment. But then he looks at the waves and he gets distracted. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he starts drowning and sinking. He goes from one moment walking on water to the next moment, making a fool of himself, drowning, asking, pleading for Jesus' help. It wasn't the only time that kind of stuff happened in Peter's life. There was a time where Jesus was asking the disciples, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And Peter, before anybody else could say it, he said, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. We know that you're the chosen one. We believe that you are the one that God has sent. You're the son of God. Jesus says, you know what? You're right. And that was revealed to you by God. Let me tell you something, Peter. His name was Simon at that time. He said, Simon, I'm going to change your name to Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I'm going to use you to build the church. I'm going to do something in your life and through your life that you can't even imagine. He, he's going to do amazing things. Like, that's pretty awesome. His passion led him to that place. But just like literally the, the next conversation, Jesus is talking at that time about, about his death and crucifixion. He's talking about what he's going to go through on the cross. And the Bible says that Peter pulls Jesus aside. Now remember, he just proclaimed, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. The Bible says he pulls him aside, and the Bible says that Peter rebuked him. He rebuked God. Just in case we're not clear on this, he rebuked God. He looked at Jesus, the Son of God, and says, Jesus, listen, you're talking crazy. You're talking about this whole death. That's not the way this is going to work. You said that I was going to be the leader of the church. So as the leader of the church, let me tell you, that's not going to happen. And what did Jesus do in that moment? Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He literally went from, from being, you're the rock that the church is going to be built on to Satan in 30 seconds. That's some of our stories. Well, I don't think there's any story that better explains and shows Peter's life and his his opposite ends and his extremes that he went through at times, always all over the place. But the reality of the greatest failure that he probably experienced, the one that was probably the one that we think of when we think of Peter, the one that, that was probably the most identity shaping in his life was the one that happened on the night that Jesus was, was betrayed. And, and the worst part about it is Jesus told Peter that he was going to do it. Like he literally told him this was going to happen. In Matthew chapter 26, after, after Jesus had had the last supper with his disciples, after Jesus had washed his disciples' feet, Peter didn't really want anything to do with that either at first, but he allowed Jesus to do it. After all that was over, Jesus begins talking. In Matthew 26, verse 31, it says, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will fall away because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead to you in Galilee. He essentially tells him exactly what's going to happen. They're going to arrest me. They're going to strike me. You're going to scatter. Don't worry. I'm going to overcome death. I'm going to rise again. And I'll meet you in Galilee. We'll figure this out afterwards. The disciples maybe didn't hear what he was saying, didn't believe that was the plan or that was going to happen. And this is what Peter said. He said, even if everybody else falls away because of you, I will never fall away. Can you imagine in that moment, he's looking around at all the other disciples. He'd be like, I believe you, Jesus, that these guys are going to fall away. Like, their faith is not, is not rock, but I'm the rock. Like, I am. You said, I was, like, I will never fall away. I'll never deny you. The other ones might, but I never will. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter says, even if I have to die 
with you, I'll never deny you. And he's a leader, right? So all the other disciples start saying the same thing. Have you ever made a promise and broken it? I was thinking about this. I, I grew up in church. Like literally my dad's been a pastor my entire life. So as a pastor's kid, I was one of those pastor's kids. You know, right? Like, you know, that's just the pastor's kid. The kid that's always doing stuff he shouldn't do. It's the pastor's kid. And I can remember growing up, we would go to camps and conferences and retreats and everything else. And always when you would go to these events, they would have, you know, guest speaker and they would talk about sin and your mistakes and your failures. And they would talk about Jesus' salvation. And every single night they would have this thing called an altar call. And I got saved every night. Like, every, like it didn't take the night before, so I had to get re-saved every single night. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any of you, that was your experience as well? It's like, I didn't understand salvation. I thought, I, I know I had sinned since yesterday. And when you go up to the altar, you'd be crying and, and you'd be all emotional and you'd just be like, I'm so sorry, Jesus, I did it again. I told you last night, you know, I wasn't gonna do it. I did it again, I'm sorry, I need to get re-saved. It didn't work the first time. You go through that process time and time again, and then afterwards, you would have like a, a time with your youth group, and you'd be like, here's the promises I'm making. Never gonna do this again. Never gonna look at that again. I'm never gonna say that again. I'm never gonna do this again. And it goes really well for like the first week you're home from camp. You're like, man, it must have worked this time. Then a couple weeks later, you realize you're just back at that same spot. All those promises you made, all those things you said you would never do, and you're back to doing those same things. You fall in again. I mean, think about Peter in this situation. I will never deny you. I will die for you if I have to, but I will never deny you. It didn't take weeks for him to fall back on his promise. He said, it's going to happen this exact night, this very night you're going to do it. And we see this is exactly what happens right after Jesus was betrayed by Judas. It says in Matthew 26, verse 69 to 75, it says, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, you were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I want you to see the progression of his denial here. Because he starts off just playing dumb. Right, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I know, I might look from, I think I actually know the disciple you're talking about. And people have told us before that we kind of look alike, but I'm not him, I'm just, I'm just here to see what's going on. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you got the wrong guy in this situation. He kind of walks away to try to avoid the situation. But it goes on to say in verse 71, when he had gone out in the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it, but this time with an oath. I don't know the man. Hinky swear. Like, I promise you. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, right? I, I'm making an oath. I don't, I don't know the guy. You got me confused with somebody else. Verse 73, after a little while, those standing there approached him and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then, listen, then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. I don't know the man, right? Like he is, you didn't think I was going to. He starts cursing and swearing in that moment. Can you just see how that escalated? I don't know what you're talking about, I promise you. He starts cursing and swearing, himself cursing and swearing, Jesus cursing and swearing, the whole situation. I don't know the man. And immediately, as he denied that third time, the Bible says a rooster crowed. And when you read about this in the Gospel of Luke, it says that as soon as that rooster crowed and as soon as he denied Jesus the third time, his eyes and Jesus' eyes met. Just think about that for a second. You told Jesus, I'll never do that. I'll never deny you. I'll never fail you. I'll never leave you. Just a few hours later, you do the exact same thing, and exactly when you do it, you look, and Jesus looks, and your eyes meet in your brokenness, in your failure, knowing that you did exactly what you promised not to do. You know it, and Jesus knows it. It says, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus that he had spoken, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times, and, and he went outside. He ran from the situation, the Bible says he wept bitterly. Peter, he fails horribly. He drops the ball. That time when Jesus needed him most, he falls at that moment when he had the opportunity to be that rock for all the rest of the disciples, he's nowhere to be found. He drops the ball. He doesn't live up to his calling. And what does he experience when he falls? What does he experience in his failure? 
remorse. He's broken by it. In fact, he can't even stay in that situation, so he runs out of there because he knows what he's done. He can't bear to continue to look at Jesus. He runs out of there. He weeps bitterly. He's devastated. And honestly, when we, when we fail, when we mess up, when we sin against God, this should be our response. Like, this should be the way we feel. Our sin should bring us to a place of remorse and regret. If we can just kind of sin and then we're like, no, nah, no big deal. Jesus loves me. That's not how we should feel when we sin against God. It should break our heart. In fact, we're talking about restoration today and Jesus being a restorer. And the first thing I want us to see when it comes to restoration is that restoration starts with remorse. Like, it starts with this feeling of, of remorse. Sometimes we're so quick to want to avoid it, aren't we? We just want to pretend like we didn't fail. We want to pretend like it didn't happen. We just want to ignore the situation and not pay attention at all. But it's important for us to, to deal with it, to experience it. Before we can experience the healing that God wants us to experience, we first have to experience the brokenness of what we've, we've done. We have to, to face our failure, own our failure, feel our failure. But here's the important part. We can't stay there. Like we can't stay in that place because this is where many people miss out on the forgiveness that God wants to have for their lives. They get stuck in this remorse. They get stuck in this brokenness. They get stuck and, and, and their failure becomes part of their identity. They can't move on. It's identity shaping. It, it takes, I'm just a failure. I messed up. I'm the worst. I'm the worst disciple ever. And they just kind of get stuck. And Zig Ziglar, he said it like this. We, he has an awesome name, by the way. He says, failure is a detour. It's not a dead end street. Like failure is a detour, it's a speed bump, but it's not a dead end street. So many times we treat our failures like they're the end of the line. Like we treat our failures like it's the last hope. Well, like, okay, I failed, I'm done. I, I've hit a dead end. There's no more hope for me. But I want to encourage you. What we see in Peter's life, what we see throughout scripture, is that even in your worst moments, even in your biggest failures, your greatest mistakes, can I tell you something? You're not beyond the restoring grace of Jesus. You're not. You can't out -sin his grace and his restoration in your, your life. So think about this for a moment. Peter, he did the thing he promised he would never do. He fails miserably. He's full of remorse. He's full of bitterness. He's full of regret. The next day, he sees the one that he has failed, beaten, tortured, and crucified. He sees him die on the cross, take his last breath. He sees him put into a tomb after knowing the last experience, the last thing he remembers having with Jesus is, is failure. He experiences all that. And now he thinks the story's over. I know Jesus talked about it, but these guys, they didn't really believe that Jesus was going to be able to do it. They didn't believe that he was going to overcome death. So for Peter's mind, he's thinking, I failed Jesus in the last moment. I'm never going to have a chance to say sorry. I'm never going to have a chance to make it up to him. Everything else that happened before this doesn't matter because when I needed to be there for Jesus, I messed up. I failed. I didn't, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I wasn't there for him. And he's broken in that. I just, can you imagine the weight of that guilt and shame at that time? Thinking he's going to be carrying that for the rest of his life. We know it was a heavy weight because Judas, the disciple that betrayed Jesus for some silver coins, said afterwards he was so overcome with, with the brokenness and the guilt, he took that silver coins and he threw it back at the feet of the of the religious leaders. I did something so wrong. I, I, made the, I, I did the worst thing, but he was so broken by his shame and what he had done, he went out and hung himself. He couldn't carry that weight anymore. He couldn't carry the weight of that shame and that brokenness. And I guarantee you, Peter's feeling the same way. Feeling like his life would just be better if it was over because he couldn't change it. So in a hopeless situation for a couple days there, thinking that it's the end, thinking he's, he's carrying this weight and Sunday comes around. And there's rumors going around that something has happened. Like there's rumors going around that Jesus has done what he, what he said he was going to do. That there was an angel at the, the tomb and he had overcome death. And the word is spreading around. In fact, there was women who went to the, the tomb and, and the angel told them to, to do this. Ready? In Mark chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Go tell the disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. Remember what he said the night? He says, I'm going to rise again. Meet me in Galilee. He said, Go tell him. That he's going ahead to Galilee and that you will see him there just as he told you. Did you notice what happened there? What did he say? He says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter was one of the disciples, so why? Why do you have to say and Peter in that moment? Because I guarantee you Peter felt like his failure had disqualified him from being a disciple. And if he wouldn't have been invited, 
specifically by name, he would have said, well, the disciples are those who didn't fail Jesus, and I failed Jesus. So I can't, I can't show up in Galilee. I can't show my face in Galilee. So the angel was clear. Tell the disciples and Peter. Make sure you let Peter know that I want to see him in Galilee. So the story we're looking at this morning in John chapter 21, Peter is still carrying the weight of that shame and that, that guilt. This is actually the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples, the story we're looking at this morning. And I was thinking about that. This is the third time, right? Can you imagine how awkward the first two meetings were? Just think, I mean, think about it for Peter. He's there, Jesus shows up. He's really, really excited on one hand. Like Jesus is, is alive. He overcame death. He did what he promised he was going to do. That's great, right? There's going to be time to, to, to make up for and tell him he's sorry, all those other kind of things. And Jesus shows up these two times, and Jesus does not mention anything about it. So he's excited on one hand, but he's also carrying the weight of that elephant in the room. He knows that there's going to be an awkward conversation at some point in their future that he doesn't really want to have. Anybody ever been there before? Like, you know you have to have that conversation, but you don't want to have that conversation. The third time now that Jesus has shown up onto the scene. So let's look at John chapter 21, verse 1 through 19. It says, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. And we're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Peter, in this moment, he goes back to what he knows best. Before Jesus called him, he was a fisherman. At this point, he thinks that his failure has disqualified him from being who God has called him to be. So he goes back to what he knows. He gets in the fishing boat. He's a leader, so all the other disciples that are there with him get in the fishing boat as well. Like, listen, this is what he's probably thinking at this moment. I failed as a disciple but I know I'm still good at fishing. So I'll just go back to what I knew. I'll just go back to my old way of life. I'll just go back to to fishing. I can at least catch some fish. And they went out all night. Like, listen, I don't don't fish, but I do know about fishing, that the point is to try to catch fish. (laughs) And they go out all night and they catch nothing. Can you imagine being in this moment? I failed as a disciple, now I suck as a fisherman. Like my life is, like I'm not good at anything anymore. That's what he's thinking. He's failing in that moment. But I I want you to see that Jesus was setting him up at this moment. It says, when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not know it was him. Maybe it was a little foggy. It says, friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Jesus said, cast the net on the other side of the boat, the right side of the boat. And you're going to find some. So they did. And they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, now just so you understand, that disciple that Jesus loved, that's John. John is the one who writes the story. He refers to himself as the one that Jesus loves. That's pretty weird. All right. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him. Again, this is Peter. For he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Jumps right into the water since they were not even far from land, about 100 yards away. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. I want you to see what Jesus is doing in this moment. And maybe it will help us better understand why Peter responds the way that he does. One of the first times that Jesus meets Peter, that Jesus calls Peter to be his disciple, was a situation kind of like that night. In Luke chapter 5, Peter had been out fishing all night. Same type of thing. Out fishing all night, catches nothing. In the morning, he's back on shore, They're cleaning their nets, getting things ready, and Jesus shows up on the scene. They probably heard about Jesus, heard stories about him, early in his ministry still. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, can I use your boat to preach for him? You can imagine Peter, he's like, I'm tired, man. I've been out here all night, I haven't caught anything. It's been a terrible night. But he says, okay, you can use the boat. So he's in the boat with Jesus. Jesus is preaching from the boat. And after they're done, after preaching, and you can imagine, he just wants to go home, go to sleep. It's been a long night. Jesus looks at him and says, let's go out fishing. Peter's thinking, I'm a professional fisherman. You're a traveling carpenter, talker person. I know what I'm doing here. I didn't catch anything. The fish aren't biting. Jesus says, just trust me. Let's go out and fish. Peter says, all right, if you say so, I will do it. And they go out and they cast their nets. 
But what happens? The Bible says they catch so many fish that it almost sinks their boat. They had to call another boat over. The other boat came over. They fill both of these boats with fish. And what is Peter's reaction in that moment? He gets down on his hands and knees and just says to Jesus, get away from me. Get away from me. I, I, I'm not worthy of you being in my boat. I'm not worthy of being, I'm, I, if you knew what I had done, if you knew who I was, you wouldn't be in this boat. You'd be in somebody else's boat. I'm a failure. I'm not a good person, Jesus. He gave him every excuse. And what does Jesus say? I know who you are. Follow me. Follow me. He says, from this day forward, you're no longer going to be a fisherman. You're going to be a fisher of men. I'm going to use you to change the world. Just follow me. I know about you. I know your failures. I know your mistakes. Follow me. So what Jesus is doing in this moment, another opportunity where Peter feels like a failure, feels like his failures have defined his, now he feels like a failure as a fisherman. And he's in that place of failure and brokenness. And Jesus recreates his calling. Jesus recreates the, the, the most significant moment in his life. The most defining moment in his life, the, the moment that he was called out of a normal life into a, a life of following Jesus, he recreates it in that moment. And Peter knows exactly what's happening in that moment. And Peter, he can't wait to get to Jesus. He's no longer focused on his failure. He's focused on his savior. And he jumps out of the boat. Everybody's like, we're not only 100 yards from shore. You can wait. He can't wait. He swims to Jesus, runs to Jesus as fast as he can because here's what should happen when it comes to our remorse. If we deal with our remorse the right way, our remorse should lead us to repentance. And repentance leads us back to Christ. See, we can choose to, to wallow in our remorse, to stay kind of stuck in that remorse. If we don't deal with our remorse, it leads to bitterness and brokenness in our lives. And if we don't deal with it, it leads then to spiritual death and separation in our lives if we don't deal with it. But if we deal with it the way that, that we're supposed to deal with it, it causes us to run to Jesus. That's what repentance looks like. The moment we stop running from Jesus and start running to Jesus is, is what repentance looks like practically lived out in our lives. The path to restoration always requires repentance. That's that turning from our sins, turning from the way we were going and turning back to, to Jesus. So that's what we see Peter doing in this moment. And in his case, he doesn't run to Jesus. He swims to Jesus, but he's got to get to Jesus as fast as he can. He jumps out of the boat. See what happens in verse 9. It says, when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire there with Jesus lying on, with fish lying on and, and, and bread. Bring some of your fish that you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled in the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Is that number significant? Some people say it is. I believe they're fishermen. It was a big catch. They took record of it because it was amazing. You know, like they talk about running to the tomb the day of and it says Peter started running, and John started running as well, and the Bible says John beat him there. He just wrote it in there because he wanted everybody to know in history and record that I beat Peter in a race. That's what they're doing in this day as well. 153 fish. That's a lot of fish. We caught a lot of fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The third thing I want us to see about restoration is that when we repent, we turn back to God, Jesus, he redeems and he restores us. Peter runs back to Jesus. When he gets to Jesus, Jesus is preparing breakfast. I like that picture. The one who, who the disciples should be serving is again serving his disciples and Peter. Peter, the one who failed him the worst, who did exactly what Jesus said he would do, Jesus is preparing breakfast for him, serving him breakfast. This is the same Jesus that washed his feet on the night that he was going to deny him. Serving him breakfast makes him some fish, gives him some bread. It's this amazing, this amazing picture of Jesus' grace and mercy, undeserved favor in his life. It says that Jesus had made a, a charcoal fire and that's pretty significant. And I'll be honest with you, I've read this story many times and I've missed this part of it many times. But I believe there was a, it was a very intentional thing in that moment why Jesus made a charcoal fire because when you read in the book of John about the night that, that he was betrayed and denied, it says when they were out in the garden that night, the fire that they were standing around when Peter denied, Jesus was a, a charcoal fire. It was a charcoal fire that he was standing around 
that night. And so I think Jesus is trying to recreate this and do something intentionally here. You see, every time, if Jesus wouldn't have done what he's about to do here, every time Peter would have thought of a charcoal fire, every time he would have smelled the charcoal burning, it would have been a reminder of his greatest failure. Have, have you ever done something so bad and every time you see something else it brings you right back to that place of failure? A charcoal fire, a rooster, that would have been it for Peter. He would have been reminded of his greatest failure, of his greatest, or the way he failed God the most. He's around a fire. Jesus recreates the night of his calling, right? Recreates the, the, the fishing, the miraculous catch of fish to show him his calling, remind him of his calling. But he also recreates the night of his greatest failure. But there's a purpose behind it. He's not recreating it to hurt Peter. He's recreating it to redeem the situation. See, up until this point, every time there's a charcoal fire, Peter's reminded of his failure, his brokenness, his mistakes. But from this point forward, every time he's around a charcoal fire, he's going to be reminded of Jesus' forgiveness and restoration. How even his worst mistake can be redeemed. He's doing this intentionally. See, when God confronts sin in our lives, he doesn't do it to hurt us. Some of us, we have this misunderstanding of who God is. That God is trying to harm me, he's trying to embarrass me, he's trying to hurt me. No, when God re reveals and confronts sin in our lives, it's never to hurt us, always to heal us. He's not doing it so that we feel shame. He wasn't doing this so that Peter would sit by the fire and be like, oh, you're bringing this up again? I don't want to deal with this. He's doing it so that when, Jesus, when Peter thinks about that fire, he was going to remember the forgiveness that Jesus gave to him, the restoration, the redemption that Jesus gave to him. When, when, when God takes away, he doesn't do it so that we experience more shame. He does it so that he can take away and relieve us of the shame that we walk around with. And that's what's happening in this moment. And so right afterwards, right after dinner, right after they sit around this fire, it says that Jesus takes Peter. And this is their conversation they have. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Then shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter's grieved in this moment that he asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus says. Three times, the same amount of times that Peter denied. Three times, Jesus brings him to this place, do you love me? The first two times that he asks Peter this question, Jesus uses this word for love, agape. Agape is that, that strongest form of love, unconditional, sacrificial, perfect love. He says to, to Peter, do you agape? Do you love me? Do you love me perfectly, unconditionally? And Peter responds the first time. And the first time he says, do you agape love me more than these? He's saying in that moment, do you love me more than all these other disciples? Do you perfectly love me more than all these other disciples? He's bringing him back to that first night where he said, I'll never do this. They may fall away. I never will. And in his pride, he was saying that. What does Peter answer? He doesn't answer with the word agape. He answers with the word phileo, which is brotherly love. Yes, God, you know I love you, but I'm not going to pretend like my love is perfect. We all know what happened. We all know how I failed. We know the mistakes that I made. I was real prideful that night, and it did not end well. So Lord, you know I love you. I can't convince you, but you know. Then feed my sheep. He asks him again, do you love me with that agape love? And Peter answers, I don't love you with agape love, but I love you as a brother. I love you with that phileo love. The third time, Jesus asks him, do you love me? Jesus uses the other word. Jesus doesn't use the word. He gets down on Peter's level. He knows that Peter cannot love him with that agape perfect love. So he asks him, do you love me like a brother? Peter's frustrated because he knows he loves him, but he knows he can't convince Jesus of his love. So he says to him, you know everything. You know everything. You know my failures. You know who I was when you first called me. You know everything about me. You know that I love you. And I want you to see what's happening in this moment. Three times Peter very publicly denied Jesus. And he thought because of that denial that he had disqualified himself. And so three times very publicly in front of the other disciples, Jesus redeems it. Jesus restores him. Jesus reminds him of his, his calling very public. Why did Jesus do? Did you notice what Jesus said there? He didn't say, hey, do you love me? Then why did you deny me? Do you love me? Then why did you, why, did you, why did you do what you did on that night? 
If you really love me, you would have never done that. I want you to see what Jesus is doing here. He never reminds him of his failure. He always reminds him of his calling. Do you love me? Yes. Jesus, you know I love you. I, I know I failed, but I do love you. Apparently, I don't love you the perfect way, but I do love you. I, I try. I love you. I know you love me, Peter. Then feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, God, you know I love you. I know you love me, Peter. I know you do. Feed my sheep. Jesus, Peter, do you love me? Jesus, you know everything. You know all of my past. You know my failures. You know my mistakes. You know I love you. I know you love me, Peter. What is he doing in that moment? I know you love me, Peter, so stop holding on to your failure. Do you notice that he never says it is failure? He never brings it up. He deals with it, but he never holds on to it. Do you love me, Peter? Yeah, I know you love me. Then let's put this behind us. It's in the past. It's not holding you back anymore. I don't remember it. I paid the price for it. Feed my sheep. Remember your calling. Remember what I called you to do. He redeems that situation, restores that, that situation. And here's why this is so important, because without restoration, our failure defines us. Until we experience that restoration, until we repent and turn to Jesus, our, our failures define us. They weigh us down. But when, when Jesus takes that thing, we repent and turn to him, he takes our worst moments, our greatest failures, he redeems them, restores them. And not only that, the last thing we see in this story is when we're restored, we experience renewed calling. Your failure is not greater than God's calling on your life. Your failure is not greater than God's calling on your life. It's not greater than Peter's calling in this moment. He messed up. Look, there's consequences to our failure. There's things we do that, that may disqualify us from certain things. But our failures did not disqualify us from God's love. Did not disqualify us from his invitation to follow. In fact, we see in verses 18 through 19. It says, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you're going to stretch out your hands. Someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify. Remember, Peter said, I'll follow you. I'll die for you. I'll do, go wherever you, you say to go. And Peter was going to die. His, his death was going to glorify God because he was going to die as a, as a disciple. So in his life and his death, he was going to glorify God. He tells him that. Afterwards, he says the, the disciple that, that, that Jesus loved was following behind them, listening to their conversation. And Peter goes, what about him? You said, I'm going to die. Is he going to die too? Jesus says, what does it matter to you? What does it matter if he dies? His, his path does not matter to you. It's not about you. Your path is your path. So follow me. I want you to see that. He brings them back, even in verse, at the end of verse 19, after saying this would indicate what kind of death Peter would die to glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. He brings him right back to that initial call, right back to that moment of salvation, right back to that moment where his life was changed. And he says, just follow me. Follow me. You don't have to have all the answers to life. You don't have to have it figured out. Just follow me. I'll lead you step by step, day by day. Just follow me. Some of us, we get so caught up in our calling that we forget that our first calling, first and foremost, is just to be with Jesus, to follow him, to experience his healing, his redemption, his restoration in our lives. Everything else flows from that calling. Everything about our lives flows from that calling. So he invites him to continue to do what God had called him to do, feed a sheep, but he invites him to just get back to following him. Just trust me. Give me your life again. Follow me. I got you. As we close today, I was just thinking about that. I was thinking about it in our own lives, and we're going to end with a time of worship in just a moment here, but I want you to think about it in your life today. Have you experienced that that restoration and that forgiveness for your sins and failures. Maybe you, you're here today and, and you kind of feel stuck in one of those places. Why don't you stand with me as we close? You just feel stuck in one of those places of, of brokenness, remorse. You've had some failures in your life, some things that you're not very proud of. You don't understand how, how Jesus in this moment could simply put the past behind him. 
Like maybe you walk around with this idea that you have to pay for your mistakes. You got to make it up to God. Yeah, I'm broken. I failed. I've messed up. So I got to, I got to do everything possible to make it up for God. I got to do everything possible to get to a place where, where God will forgive me. I can earn his forgiveness. That's what's so amazing about God's grace. There's an acronym for grace that simply said grace is, is, is God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, when we experience his grace in our life, his restoring grace, we experience God's riches, his blessings in our lives, not based on what we do to earn it, but based on the fact that, that Christ did everything for us. He paid the price for sins. And the reason Jesus is able to do what he did here for Peter, the reason he's able to just forgive him and restore him, the reason that, that Peter did not have to pay for the mistakes that he made, and the reason that you don't have to pay for all the mistakes and failures that you've made in your life, isn't because Jesus doesn't care and he just looks past them. It's because Jesus already paid for them. Like that's what the cross is. He already paid for them. He already paid for your failure. He already paid for your brokenness. He already paid for that, that shame. He already paid for that remorse. He already paid for your, your failure. You can choose to live your life feeling like you're in debt to God or you can choose to receive his grace and his forgiveness and his restoration as you repent and turn to him. You don't have to pay for it because Jesus already paid for it for you. He took your shame and your sin. The Bible says by his stripes, you are healed. Not just physically healed, spiritually healed, whole. If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus, and you walk around with that weight of shame and guilt, feeling like you can never get to God, that you can never be worthy of God's love, I'll tell you something, you can't. But Jesus, Jesus did it for you. He did what you could never do. He paid the price that you could never pay. He died in your place for your sins, and he overcame death. And we celebrate that last week, but guess what? He's still alive, and he's still changing life. And every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday we get to celebrate that he's conquered death and sin for us. And if you're in here and you're walking in that shame and that guilt, you don't have to leave this place today like that. He promises to take your shame, to take your remorse, to take those failures, and to make you a new creation. So with every head bowed and eyes closed today, before we end in this time of worship, if you're here today, you don't know Jesus yet. You've been running from Jesus. You've been hiding from Jesus. You've been carrying a weight, trying to fill that, 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 that emptiness in your life with so many other things that will never give you what you're looking for. I wanna invite you today to open your life to Jesus. So if there's anybody in here today who says, today's that day, I'm saying yes to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand right now as I know I'm praying with you as we close? I'm gonna look around for just a second. God is knocking at your heart right now. He's drawing you to him. Would you just raise your hand? I see that hand over there. Is there anybody else? Say, today I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm gonna pray with you in just a second. And as we pray and close today, I wanna encourage you if, you, if you respond to, you're responding to the gospel, pray in your own words to Jesus. Invite him to be that Lord and that Savior. Give him your sins today. Before you leave this place today, I would encourage you also to fill out that card in front of you, bring it out to the next steps area so we can give you a Bible, give you some resources, come in contact with you so that we can help you as you begin this journey as a follower of Christ. So Father, today, God, I thank you for that hand that is raised. And if there's anybody else in this place today who is walking in that shame, that guilt, the weight of the burden, God, I pray today that they would turn to you. God, I thank you that you paid the price for all of our failures. Lord, that we do not have to walk in shame and in guilt with the heaviness that we cannot bear. Your word says that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. God, I pray today that we would run to you, turn to you, give you our sins. God, we will receive your forgiveness. We will walk as a new creation from this day forward. God, when we look at our past and we look at our mistakes and our failures, we wouldn't be reminded of our failures, but we would be reminded of your grace, your goodness, and your mercy in our lives. We thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you today also for anybody who's in this place today who maybe is a follower of you. God is walking with some kind of sin in their life, some kind of shame in their life. They're carrying remorse because of what they've done, what they've said, how they've acted. They're walking in the darkness of some kind of addiction right now, God. God, I pray just like Peter in our failures that we would not run from you, but we would run to you. God, I pray even right now, God, that they would confess that sin that they're struggling with, that they would worship you and give it to you today, that they would stop running but run towards you, God. I thank you that your love for us is still there. Your grace for us is still sufficient. Your mercies are new every single day, God. I pray and thank you that our failures do not have to define us. Your redemption defines us.
So we give it all to you today. We receive your forgiveness, receive your love. We walk as that new creation and that new identity that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.